Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, this week we are in uh, Vayatet Hanan. And uh, Tommy, if you do us the pleasure of telling us what this means in the Hebrew, please, bro. Yeah, thanks, Joe. No problem. Um, yeah, Vayat Hanan. As we know, it's a continuation of Moses' recap, isn't it, basically? So, um, but he, he puts a lot of things there. Uh, there's many references here to what's already going on before, and it really is packed. Um, on the way up, uh, Michelle was speaking, saying that this is probably one of her favourite sort of portions, because mm. it, it, it cites many of your favourite verses, etc. Um, so in the Hebrew, Vayet Hanan, it's a... Uh, I suppose the nearest we get in English is, yeah, I pleaded, which is up on the screen there. Yeah, I pleaded. Um, it's It comes from the verb uh, hanan, uh, which means to show favour or grace, grace uh, to, to show, um, to deal graciously with. And where it says vayet hanan, uh, I pleaded. This is Moses speaking now, where he, he pleaded with God. It could, it's, um, it's, it's maybe to beseech something, uh, to earnestly request something. It could e even be used there uh, in the sense of to beg. I say, not, not, not pitifully, but really in a heartfelt way, you know. Um, when he, when he says this, I plead, he, he, he really meant it. He meant it from the depths of his, uh, his soul. Um, but this word, uh, via Hanan, that it comes from Hana, the word Hana which actually means to decline or to bend down. Uh, when we camped somewhere, we would chana. Because we, uh, we, it's, you, you, you're basically settling, uh, inclining yourself down onto the land, basically. Mm -hmm. it, it's very metaphorical. Um, so yeah, back to Moses, he was, he was basically plead, pleading with God. He let go of all pride. He was the humblest man on earth, and he was pleading with God, um, to uh, enter the land, which God had already said he wouldn't. But then he's, he's conceded to God's um, denial. And he's realised that it's not my will be done, but yours be done. Even as great as Moses was, so it's a lesson for all of us. We could pray for things and earnestly seek things, but if it's not in accordance with God's will, we have to let it go and let God's will be done. Um, because he knows best. You know, it's, sometimes it's easier said than done. We can really pray for something from the depth of our heart and um, God will deny it. But it's because he loves us, he denies it and he has a bigger plan in store. And as we'll see, um, Moses, uh, God did have a bigger plan for Moses. Uh, he, he said, you won't be going into the land. But then centuries later, we see him on the mount with uh, Elijah and there they are with, with Yeshua. You know, so uh, I'm sure you're going to touch on this, Joseph, because mm -hmm. um, he earnestly sought and besought God to let him in to see the, what God had in store. And uh, eventually God did, but not in a way Moses realised at that time. But I'm sure God showed him that. Um, so basically what we have to remember is to, um, we have to acknowledge that whatever we pray and whatever we earnestly seek, that we have to fully accept yeah, our God's response. And that uh, one day he will allow us to ascend that mountain to be with Yeshua. Hallelujah, beautiful, thank you, bro. So, at Canaan, in a nutshell, Moses pleads with the Lord regarding permission to allow him to cross over the Jordan and see the good land. However, the Lord has other plans for Moses. After this, a call against idolatry is made and the Shema is given to Israel. So, our portion begins in Deuteronomy 3, it's in verse 23. Uh, it's, a, it's a short chapter to open with. So if you would do us that pleasure, please, Tom, from verse 23 yeah. to the end. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Then I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, you have begun to show your servants your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains and Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and wouldn't listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough of that, speak no more to me of this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift your eyes toward the west, the north, the south and the east. 
Behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan. But command Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which you will see. So we stayed in the valley opposite Beth Peor. Thank you, bro. So we see Moses' request here about entering into the land, and you've got to think. Think about all that time. My man come out of Egypt, he went through all of them plagues, and he goes through the wilderness, all the epics and all the stations that take place. I think you mentioned 42 stations and yeah. all. My man must have been so, you know, he needed to retire in that land flowing with milk and honey. And it does seem as though the Lord is, is pretty harsh in, in Moses and all that he's done and he doesn't allow him to enter in. And I want to highlight some things for you here to reshape our perspective on this because I think it's really important that we get the character of our father right, because this can be misconstrued, and many scholars um, would suggest that, you know, God denied Moses access, that he rejected his prayer, but we're gonna see that it's quite on the contrary. The first thing that I wanna highlight is how Moses honors his father. It says that he pleaded with the Lord at that time, and he said, oh Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. It's funny, isn't it? Because Moses is like, he's pretty old now. He's been on, he's been going around this for 40 years. He's got to know the Lord. And he's saying now, you have only just yeah. begun to show your loving kindness. And it's like, doesn't matter what age we are on this walk, God is still revealing more of himself to us. Always, he's still re revealing more of himself to us. Verse 25, he says, I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains and Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said, enough, speak no more to me of this matter. Now this verse alludes to many things, but firstly, I wanna show the intercessory archetype of Yeshua by propitiation. What do I mean by that? Notice in verse 26, Moses says, but the Lord was angry with me on your account. We see the intercession, the propitiation, the type and shadow of Yeshua, how he became that propitiation for our sin. And the Lord poured out his wrath upon him so that we can be exempt from that wrath in him and faith in him. So Moses plays that intercessory archetype, that priestly intercessor there, who, who almost takes the propitiation of the Lord's judgment on behalf of the nation. And that's a type and shadow of Yeshua, who is a prophet like unto Moses, who fulfills this entirely, but for the whole world. Isn't that curious? Now, the next thing that I want to mention here is that many scholars do suggest that, you know, the prayer of Moses and the petition of Moses was just cold heartedly rejected by God. You know, um, if you look at your bookmark, maybe in some of the, in the Bibles that have uh, headings uh, that correlate to the context of what's taking place, many will say, Moses' prayer denied or Moses forbidden to enter into the land. And I want to reshape our pers perspective of that um, because on further examination, we find something quite remarkable. But it's curious that Tommy opened up about Moses being the most humble man because this is how I want to um, unpack this properly. Numbers 12 verse 3. Now the man Moses was very humble more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. This was Moses's unique, it's famous characteristic uh, related and correlated to Moses. He was the most humble man, more than any men who were on the face of the earth. That's incredible, that isn't it? So despite having forfeited the right to experience the land firsthand, Moses still remained the most humble man on earth. And he honored the heavenly father by fulfilling his will and not rebelling or stirring up a fuss, or allowing covetousness to overtake him in his final moments. I want to address something because we can allow covetousness to creep in by desiring a reality that is in not in accordance with God's will or desire. What do we mean by that? Moses wanted to enter in the land and he had every right to desire to enter in and he had every right to pray and make a petition for that. But he doesn't kick up a fuss and rebel when God says no. He doesn't covet a situation that is not in accordance with God's will. He humbles himself and he says, Shema. He says, Amen. If it's God's will, Amen. If it's not God's will, Amen, because it's still God's will. We can have peace if it's God's will. We can have peace if it's not God's will, because it's still God's will and it's not his will to do that. 
you know, this is revolutionary in our thinking and to stay humble in these situations will prevent us from coveting a situation or a reality. Oh, if I just get that, or if I'm just in this position, or maybe if God does this for me or that for me, then my life will be better. Well, if that's not in accordance with God's will, are we coveting a reality that he has not desired for us? Sometimes we have to just go through them realities because there's a greater plan in store, beloved. Little did Moses know at this time, he was going to enter in, in the most intended way, with Yeshua in spirit, next to Elijah, he goes in with the king of kings, goes in spiritually. Little did he know that at the time. So Moses honours his heavenly father, and are we honouring our heavenly father? Because there's a commandment in the ten in the ten words that says we shall honor our father and mother but spiritually that's about honoring Jehovah and his will and that's also about honoring Jerusalem the mother of us all creation and the land that we live so we should honor our father and not desire a reality uh, or desire a, a circumstance that is not in accordance with his will we have to be careful with that and Moses was aware of this and he was the he was the most humble man on the face of the whole earth. So it's a, it's a super weapon against covetousness. Um, and by doing God's will and honouring him, we honour our Heavenly Father. Check this out, Psalm 147, verse 6. The Lord lifts up the humble, but casts down the wicked to the ground. Notice how Moses was the most humble man. And the Bible says that the Lord lifts up the humble. So, was Moses lifted up in honour and esteem by the Lord? Was he instructed to climb atop of the Pisgah and lift up his eyes to see the good land? Of course he was. Moses was even taken by the Lord and buried first hand by Jehovah himself. Even in death he was lifted up. Even in death he was lifted up. Remember what he said. The Lord said to him, sorry, go up atop of the Pisgah and lift up your eyes, westward, northward, eastward, southward, and behold with your eyes. So Moses was honoured, he was given a prophetic download. In the Hebrew it says, Re'e, Nasa Re'e, behold with your eyes and lift your eyes up and have a download. So he's not just going around doing a compass like a static, like a static mannequin, just looking around going, oh, he's showing me the cake but I can't eat it. He went up to have a download from the Lord to see past, present and future. That's Hebraic idiomatic language. So he was lifted up from the grave, as the scripture says, the Lord lifts up the humble. So we want to be lifted up out of the grave, don't we? We want to lift up our heads for our redemption to draweth near. So by making ourselves low, the Lord lifts us up. What did Yeshua say? Them who abase themselves shall be exalted, but them who exalt themselves shall be abased. But he cast the wicked down to the ground. There's something else that I want to show you cryptically that resolves um, how Moses did actually inherit the land. Listen to this, Psalm 37, verse 11. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundance of prosperity. Moses was the most humble man on the earth. The Lord lifts up the humble. And we read in scripture, the humble will inherit the ha'aretz in Hebrew, the land, the literal land. Often we translate this in Matthew 5 with Yeshua at the Sermon on the Mount. The meek shall inherit the earth. Yeshua pulled this from this Psalm, Psalm 37. The humble or the meek, it's the same word in Hebrew, will inherit the land. The Haaretz, they will inherit the literal land. So there's a cryptic message showing how Moses truly does inherit the land in his humility. He was the most humble man on the face of the earth and God had a plan for him to enter into the land. But he didn't cross the Jordan that day physically. He crossed over from death to life spiritually with Yeshua. And lo and behold, we see the fulfillment of his plea over a thousand years later. So just as Moses pled and said, let me go over on that godly mountain and see that good land. A thousand years later, there he is in the land with Yeshua, side by side with Elijah in spirit, resurrected in life. Isn't that incredible? Moses was actually in the land and seen at the right hand of Yeshua on the Mount of Transfiguration. This proved that God did in fact honor Moses' request. Not only did Moses enter in, but he was also with the King of Kings, he was with the Mashiach. So the Lord reconciled the plea of Moses, just not on Moses' terms, it was on God's terms. So I just want you to think about something, uh, a plea or a petition that you've made with God 
what if, like Moses, the fulfillment will not be quite as what we are asking for, but more outrageously radical and extremely divine than we can possibly ever imagine? Mm -hmm. What if that plea and that petition that you are earnestly seeking the Lord on, he is going to take that and give you something that your mind cannot even imagine. What does the scripture say? I have not seen, nor ear hath heard, nor thought entered into the heart of man, what the Lord of hosts has planned for them that love him. Do you believe it, beloved? You cannot even comprehend with your imagination, with your eyes and your ears, what God has in store for them that love him. This is the God who we serve. With man, mm. nothing, not everything is possible. But with the Lord of hosts, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What if our pleas and our petitions that we have earnestly sought the Lord on are just yet to happen because it needs to happen in Jehovah's time? Mm -hmm. Therefore, beloved, do not covet a situation that is not in accordance with his will. Rest in his will and be humble, for the Lord will prevail. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And remember what he said, and this is in the King James Bible. Beautiful. He says, I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond the Jordan, that goodly mountain, singular, and the Lebanon. And then lo and behold, there he is on the goodly mountain, Mount Hermon, in Lebanon. So if you believe that the Mount of Transfiguration is the goodly mountain that is in Lebanon, then there he is, it's all being fulfilled. He actually, the very words he said were fulfilled, but in a greater way, in a supernatural way, in a way he could not expect. This is why he was instructed to go up, go up the mountain, go up the Pisgah. He had his request honoured. So the Lord said to me, go up the top of the Pisgah, lift up your eyes towards the west, towards the north, towards the south and the east. Behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over the Jordan, but command Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him. For she, he shall go over before this people and he shall cause them to inherit the land, which you will see. God told him, which you will see. Have you missed that? God actually said, the land that you will see. Cryptically, it's woven in there. Remember what he said? I pray, let me cross over and see the good land. And the Lord then responds in verse 28. He shall cause them to inherit the good land, which you will see. So he was going to see it. We've got to get this out of our head that his request was rejected. Mate, this was the most humble man. This, he was the Lord's best mate. <laughs> Jehovah was his best friend. He saw the Lord face to face. You get me? The Lord had bigger plans for him. And the Lord has got bigger plans for you, beloved. You know Yeshua. You've confessed the only begotten. He lives within you. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. That petition, that prayer that you're requesting on the Lord, it's got to come at his time. And we're not God. Quit playing God. Just trust in the Lord and know that he has a big plan for you. And your petition is heard. Your prayer is heard. But it comes in his time and, and not in ours. Yeah. How often are we hearing the Lord's promises? How often are we capturing them in the chamber of our hearts and living them in accord, living into them in accordance with what he said? What do we mean by that? Moses made a, a petition and God re responded to his petition by saying that will come true. So if we open the word and we read all them promises, how often are we hearing them promises, living into them promises, pressing into them promises, proclaiming them promises back to God and waiting with hope and expectation diligently for them things to come true? Because if he said it, it's a done deal. Do we have enough faith to believe that? When the Son of Man come, will he find that faith in the earth, beloved? This is how we need to live our lives, in the promises of God, in the covenant, in the word of Jehovah in accordance with what he said. I often think, do you reckon Moses heard that bit? God says, you know, Joshua will lead them into the land to inherit the land which you will see. And he's like, what today? Or <laughs> next week? Or in the future? Often in life when the Lord promises us something, I have not seen, ear have not heard, nor thought entered into the heart of man what the Lord of hosts has in store for them that love him. So Moses was instructed to lift up his eyes and see a prophetic future. Are you lifting up your eyes and seeing a prophetic future? Before his departure, God gave Moses insight of a world to come, of a future to come. Do you know about the future to come? 
Have you got eternity stamped on your eyeballs? Are you preparing now like we are already entering into the kingdom of God? Behold, the reign of Elohim is here is upon you. Are we pressing in and entering into Mashiach now? Are we living like priests as in accordance with the book of Revelations and what it says that we shall do in the millennium reign? Are we doing that now? Because we have an opportunity to. We need to be like Moses. We need to behold Re'e, the promises of God, and see forward and not be locked in the now. Because if we get locked in the now, chances are we get locked in the flesh and we try and get our way out and struggle it and spin all these plates and do what we can in our own strength to make it work instead of just trusting the process and allowing Jehovah's will to saturate us. And then we can move in priestly operations with trust, confidence, hope, and expectation. So out of all of our petitions to God, what petition in particular should we be prophetically looking towards a hopeful future with Yeshua involved in it? Because he wanted to enter in the land that day physically, but God's like, hang on a minute, you can go in spiritually with Yeshua, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Not only that, you're going to be with Elijah, you're going to be with your forefathers, you're going to be with the brethren in a spiritual way. And I'm also going to use you in a prophetic future again in the ministry of Yeshua. And again, in the book of Revelations, it's like, whoa, wasn't expecting that. Wasn't expecting that. So the thing we want physically is not necessarily what the Lord has, has planned for us spiritually. Okay, so what takes place next? Deuteronomy 34, verse 5. And I'm going now to the end of the Torah because we've just been told about what would take place with Moses. So I want to highlight something that I think is important for us to lead into the next uh, phase of what we're going to speak about. So the death of Moses and his burial is one of the most significant things in Scripture, and it cannot be underestimated. Mysteriously, Moses dies, but something peculiar happens. It's very unique. The Lord takes him and buries him. And the scripture says, no one knows to this day where he is buried. Check it out, Deuteronomy 34, verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And the Lord buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his grave to this day. So God buries Moses. And no one knows. It doesn't say no man. No one knows. No one knows. Why does it say that? Because no fallen angel or principality even know. In fact, we read in Jude 9, listen to this. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring a reviling accusation, but said rather, the Lord rebuke you. Isn't that curious? So the Lord buries Moses, very unique. It's the only account that we read of the Lord doing this. And then we read in Jude how actually the archangel Michael contended with the devil because the devil wanted to claim over Moses. So there's, there's, there's something spiritual even going on with Moses in his death. Right? In his death, this is really important. So both of these verses confirm a mystical outcome for the destination of Moses. And using the gospel, we can understand why. In the future, Moses was to be seen side by side with Yeshua Messiah. Michael the Archangel contended with the body of Moses as there was alternative plans for Moses and the devil tried to prevent that. Likewise, Elijah was uniquely taken in a similar way by the Lord. Remember the account of Elijah? What happened to Elijah? What happened? He was taken up in a whirlwind. Angels were involved in his departure. Just like Moses, angels were involved in his departure. Likewise, Elijah was uniquely taken in a similar way. He too was mystically taken up by angels in a whirlwind to heaven. Angels too intervened in his departure. Uniquely, these two men are then seen again in the future at the Mount of Transfiguration. And this is why, this is what I'm leading to now. Matthew 17, the gospel accounts, when Yeshua transforms on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make these three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out from the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. 
hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now when they had come down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why did the scribes say Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said, Indeed, Elijah must come first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has already come, and they did not know him, but did him to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke about John the Baptist. So, I mean, get your head round that. Mm. You imagine that? That's like the most trippiest thing ever. Bear in mind, none of these have took hallucinogenics. They all go up the mountain with your shoe. They're probably like, oh, why is he taking us up this mountain? He turns round next minute. He, he manifests in all his glory. Even his clothes go bright white. Moses and Elijah turn up and start speaking to him about his departure. In the Greek, it's exodusia. They're speaking to him about the new exodus in which the prophet, like unto Moses, will now free people from slavery, but not a slavery of Egypt, a slavery of sin. But how he will be like a prophet unto Moses who will have that intercessory uh, propitiation placed upon him to free his people. But some things I want to highlight here is why did the disciples say Elijah must come first? And what did Yeshua mean by saying, indeed, he is already, uh, indeed, he shall come, but has already come? And where did the disciples get this understanding from? Now, the answer is in Malachi. So, the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament in your Bibles, the final book is the book of Malachi. Are we all aware of this? Mm -hmm. So, on the next page, it is literally Malachi chapter 4. Uh, Matthew. It ends in verse 6 and then it, it goes into Matthew chapter 1. All right. So I want to highlight some things here for where they got this understanding from. Because Malachi is the final book in the Tanakh. And it was basically the book of Revelations for the Jews because this was the final book for them. Okay. So if we look here, we've got Malachi chapter 4. And then straight away, there we go. We're in the book of Matthew. Okay. So what did Yeshua mean by these things? Elijah must come and restore all things, but indeed Elijah has come already. Well, if we look at the end chapter of Malachi, we're going to see a prophetic message about the day of the Lord that's coming, but how Moses and Elijah appear. How Moses and Elijah appear. Listen to this. Verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, the day of the Lord, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wicked, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. We read in scripture how the Lord has reserved fire until the day of judgment, that the Lord makes his chariots flames of fire, that he judges the earth by fire in the second time. So we read all of that and we know it, and this is what it's alluding to in the day of the Lord. But first of all, listen to this. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all of Israel with the statutes and the judgments. Behold, I will send Elijah the prophets before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of their fathers to the children and the hearts of their children to their fathers. Least I come and strike the earth with a curse. So this is why the disciples said these things to Yeshua. But now all of a sudden, there's Moses and there's Elijah. Yeshua's transforming into this pure embodiment of light, the divine Shekinah glory. And now they're saying, whoa, is this it? Is, is this it? Is the Lord going to restore, reinstate the kingdom? Mm -hmm. And they're seeing Malachi, which was like their book of revelations, because after Malachi, that was it until Yeshua come. Now they're seeing Moses and Elijah appear. So this prophetic message is taking place now. And curiously, it's 400 years from Malachi to Matthew. Isn't that incredible? Almost like the 400 years of enslavement in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And then he said, oh, no, it's 430. Well, if Yeshua was 30 at the time of his ministry, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. That would make so much sense. That's quite incredible yeah. that we see that take place. So it's very prophetic. But what am I getting at here? What am I getting at? What's curious is that the Tanakh alludes to both Moses and Elijah coming before the great and terrible day of the Lord. This iconic number, 400, which was the time of silence, they call it, from Malachi to Matthew, was a time when Israel was 
uh, in captivity, a lot of heavy things happened to the nation. It was known as a time of silence. But it would also be indicative of Yeshua, who is the prophet like unto Moses, who comes after that 400 year mark to free the children of Israel again from slavery, okay? And he comes with a new exodus, a new exodus here, with great signs and wonders, great signs and wonders, and redeems Israel with an outstretched arm. Remember, Moses did it with an outstretched arm, pr prophetically. Yeshua does it with the outstretched arm on the cross. It's all symbolic. And this Quite time, well. Yeshua can go in with Israel. To yeah, the man. Yeah. Well, he's the one mm. who does go in. Mm. When, um, when the Lord says, you shall encourage and strengthen Joshua, for he shall take them in. That could read that the Torah shall strengthen and encourage Yeshua to take the children of Israel in who shall inherit the land. So Moses is still part of this story of God. He's still part of the story of God, even after he's dead uh, on the earth and buried, so to speak. So what am I getting at? What am I getting at here? Why is this event significant? What does it matter? And how can we see the fulfillment of this take place in the book of Revelations? The plot thickens. As the book of Revelations proclaims that two witnesses in the end times, in a prophetic future, will rise up in the last days and they're going to move in great power with great signs and great wonders. And these two witnesses will face the Antichrist directly and they will be martyred for the entire world to see as they stand as the last witnesses on earth before the second coming of Yeshua. However, after their death, they will be resurrected and stir a great revival on the earth. Lo and behold, they will be taken up to heaven by God in the same manner as before. Let's read it. Revelations 11, we need to know what this is. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar and those who worship there, but leave out the court which is outside of the temple and do not measure it for that has been given over to the Gentiles and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. That's three and a half years biblically. These are two olive trees and two lampstands standing before God, the God of earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this like manner. Verse six, these have the power to shut up heaven so that no rain falls in the day of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with plagues as often as they desire. Right, let's break this down. What, how do we identify these two men or these two entities? So they're not Gentiles, okay? They're not Gentiles. That, that we can get off the first thing. The two witnesses that are prophetic. So who was the one, who was the prophet who wasn't a Gentile, who was able to shut up the rain and stop the rain? Elijah. Elijah. And who was the one who turned water to blood and brought plagues? Moses. Moses. So I don't need to say it's Enoch or it's this or that or whatever. It's right there. We don't need to overcomplicate this. These two witnesses are moving in the spirit of Elijah and in the spirit of Moses, in the law and in the prophets. Okay, that's how these two are moving. Now notice that in sackcloth, which is related to mourning, the day of atonement, and repentance. So they're telling people to return now back to the covenants. They're not Gentiles, meaning they're not of the nations. The two Ibri, the Hebrew, the Messianic, because they're telling people to return back to the covenants. Mm -hmm. Notice how the olive trees, what is Israel indicative of right the way through the Bible? The olive tree. Notice how that they are two menorahs. <coughs> Lampstands, it says they are menorahs. What is the menorah indicative of in scripture? the seven spirits of the Lord, the Ruach HaKadosh, the Sabbath. Notice as well that they are standing before God. Who was standing before God on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah. So some suggest that this could actually be the two houses of Israel as a whole. And I'm unsure of that exactly, but I do believe that they are two individuals that will manifest physically. So maybe the two houses is there. Yeah, we see that because I do believe that when you look at their genealogies, 
One represents the house of Joseph, Ephraim or Israel, and the other represents the house of Judah, Moses through Levi. So we do see an image of the two houses. And do, some people do suggest that it's the two houses of Israel in the latter days. But I think that it will be two literal individuals that will manifest. And um, when we look at the Bible in context, we look at like Moses and Aaron, Elijah and Elisha, Yeshua and John the Baptist, uh, Paul and Timothy, Paul and Barnabas. All of these people go in twos. The Lord sent them out in twos. Out the mouth of two or three witnesses is a matter established. So I do think that it will be two people as well. So could they be the two houses of Israel? It's possible. It's possible. <clears throat> Whoever or whatever they are, they ain't coming with rosary beads and Hail Marys. Okay. <laughs> They're not coming with an Anglican vicar collar. They're coming in the spirit of Moses and Elijah, the Torah and the prophets, the olive tree, the menorahs. They're not coming like the vicar of Dibley. <laughs> They're not coming like the vicar of Dibley. This is the two biblical messianic witnesses in the end times who were the olive tree and they're not Gentiles, it says. Okay, so they're not coming with 10 Hail Marys to tell people to repent. They're not coming as Orthodox Catholics, Jehovah Witnesses, Pentecostals. They're not coming as that. The Bible says they're coming as Messianic Torah keepers in sackcloth telling people to return to Teshuvah. And they bring a great revival. They turn hearts back to the Lord. They come with menorahs and olive trees. If you know what the olive tree is right the way through scripture, it's Israel. The menorah is indicative of the tabernacle, the throne room, the temple. The coming as menorahs from the throne of God as two pressed olive trees with the power of God's life flowing through them. The coming in sackcloth and calling people to repent before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So why is this important, beloved? Because these two witnesses in the end times are definitely connected to the Lord and the prophets. And this confirms our messianic walk. And that's what I want to do today. I want to confirm and encourage you that this walk that you've taken on board, the messianic walk, is true. It's the truth. And in the book of Revelations, the two witnesses come in the like, likewise manner. That's how they come. That's how they come. We can prove it. We see the two houses there, the menorahs, the olive trees. They come with a loud voice telling people to teshuvah. They move in the power of Elijah and they move in the power of Moses. It's not incredible. They compel the world to repent. So yeah, these two uh, witnesses, they have a messianic identity. Go ahead, bro. Yeah, just as we were doing midweek in the gospel studies as well, the 42 months that's mentioned there, um, as Tommy mentioned a few weeks back, there's 42 signposts on the way to the promised land. And midweek in the gospels, we looked at how there was um, 42 generations from uh, Abraham to um, Yeshua, ultimately when the promise yeah, was given, man. split into 14 times. So again, you can see there how this is, this is the 42 is like um, pointing you to a sign of lineage here, as you were saying, Israel the, 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 the olive branch. Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, so what takes place? What takes place with these two witnesses? Verse seven in Revelation says, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them and kill them. Verse eight, and their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Verse nine, then those from all tribes and all tongues and all nations will see their dead bodies for three and a half days. And they will not allow their, their bodies to be put into graves. How, how do you see that? What does that look like? How are all nations, peoples going to see it? They're going to see it over the telly and the internet. This is how they're going to see these bodies in the streets. How are all nations and all peoples going to be able to witness this? If you're living in Zimbabwe and this happens in Jerusalem, they're going to see this over the Medea, over the media, the prince of the power of the air. Verse 10, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice and make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth in them days. Verse 11, now after three and a half days, the breath of life will enter into them from God and they will stand on their feet and great fear shall fall upon all them that see. Verse 12, and they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw. In that same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 
In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to God, the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Okay, so are we in the last days? Would we all say that we're in the last days? Okay, we're all in the last days. Okay, that means sooner or later, them who are spiritually minded in wisdom, knowledge and understanding should know that the place where our Lord was crucified has turned into Sodom and Egypt. Verse 8, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. Where was the Lord crucified? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Okay, so in the latter days, in the last days, Jerusalem has now this title. It is spiritually called, not, physic, not physically, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. So for them who are spiritually minded, we've got to stop beating around the bush here because we've already been told what Jerusalem is going to look like in the latter days. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Egypt, why, why would Jerusalem be called Egypt in the latter days? Egypt represents power, luxury and world influence. It is symbolically describing a nation which influences the earth through a pyramid system with an elite at the top and the masses at the bottom. The pyramid is the great symbol of Egypt. The pyramid is a system of control which is supported by the contributing masses at the bottom and controlled by a powerful elite at the top, pharaohs of Egypt. Egypt represents a powerful international economy a strong military and is notorious for false religions and the practice of worshipping numerous gods. This was the first spiritual title given to Jerusalem in the latter days. Sodom represents an empire which indulges in sexual immorality, fornications, sexual perversions legally. It symbolises those who operate in lustful depravity. The term given for Jerusalem in the last days then, thus reflects a worldly nation with its characteristics of the two heathen empires. It is powerful, polytheistical, meaning worshipping different gods, multiple gods occupy it, as well as carnal and lustfully benevolent. Many abominations shall be taking place in Jerusalem in the last days. Malevolent. We gotta stop beating around the bush here, okay? And looking at the destruction of both Sodom and Egypt, you can easily assume that this place is very much in God's disfavor. It is in a sinful state. And this is why Yeshua says, them in Judea, flee to the mountains. For them that are in the field, don't go back to get your garments. If you're up on a rooftop, don't go back to get provision. Them who are in Judea, flee. This place is gonna get melted. So. Let us examine this now. Let's investigate. Can we see the state of Israel? And can we see Egypt there? Can we see Egypt there? Let's take a look. Behold, on the screen is the Israeli Supreme Court and governmental buildings riddled with Egyptian obelisks to Ra and Masonic architecture. We even have a Rothschild monument in a lat that actually has a Masonic engravement on it, built by the Rothschild, the two pillars of Solomon, and they say Solomon was the first Mason. You can read this in all plaques all over Israel. They even have in this Israeli Supreme Court a pyramid with, with, with a capstone that looks like an eye. I mean, come on. It doesn't take a genius to work out that this architecture is Egyptian. It's esoteric. It's Masonic. This is why in the latter days, Jerusalem shall be called Egypt. Yeah spiritually for what is taking place there now the rothschild if no one knows who they are they are a banking family a notorious banking family a monarch family of ashkenari jews okay and on screen is netanamu theresa may and jacob rothschild and jacob rothschild happens to be one of the richest men on the earth him and his family and in his house he has the balfour declaration does anyone know what the balfour declaration is well, this was a piece of paper that brought around the state of Israel. It was an occupied land by Britain, and Britain will join the war if you give us that land. If you sign it over from Palestine, we'll join the war, and then we can have it and we can put the Jews there. This was all directed by wicked and evil people, you know. And he's even got that in his mansion. And look at them all smiling. And if you don't think Jacob Rothschild is a wicked, evil, sinister, Illuminati heretic, on the screen, 
is some pictures from his house. You can actually purchase this image. Satan summoning his legions. I had to blot it out because it was phallics all over the show. And Jacob Rothschild there is with Marahina Abramovich. Does anyone know who this woman is? She's a witch. She's been coined the, the, the feminine Alistair Crowley of the 21st century. She advocates for spirit cooking, child sacrifice in the name of art, by the way. And there she is chilling with Jacob Rothschild. And on the screen, this looks like it's out of the never ending story, the Fantasia Council. I mean, it's off its rocket. This is how these people party. This is how these people, they dress up as Bathamets. This was a party that took place. They go to these eyes wide shut parties where they all dress up as different uh, creatures and characters, Bathamets and um, it's just wicked. These take place on these real estates. These people are evil. The scripture says, take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them with the light. But why does this matter? Because this man and his family were behind the creation of the political state of Zionism. And this can be proven. And on screen is a Wikipedia screenshot saying how the Rothschild are an Ashkenari Jewish family. If you do not know, the Bible says... In the latter days, behold, there is a synagogue of Satan that say the Jews, but are not Jews, but do fly. I will make them come down and worship at thy feet, for they shall know that I have loved thee. He says this twice. There's a synagogue of Satan in the latter days. This is who the synagogue of Satan is in the latter days. That claim to be Jews, but are not, but do fly. But do fly. What else can we prove? What else can we prove here? How else can we prove this? The symbol that represents the state of Israel mm. is a six-pointed, six-sided, six-polygon. It has a, a numerical value, an isometric value of 666. Now, when I came on this path, I was taught, I sat under Charlie and John Paul, and they attended uh, a fellowship in Wales that was pro-Israel. And these men were trying to tell me at the time that, you know, the state of Israel was, was the true Israel. And, you know, they, they recoiled later on. But this was the biggest stumbling block for me because I'd come out the occult and I'd been researching all this stuff. And that hexagram, well, that's how you, that's how you summon a demon. That's how you bring a demon up in, in the occult and witchcraft. And Solomon taught this when he fell into gross idolatry. And a lot of these talismans come out of Babylon, they come out of Egypt, and there's a synchronization, a mixture that's took place. But look, I'm not trying to bash the Jews here. We've got to come out of all the mystery religions, whether it's Catholicism, whether it's Islam, whether it's Judaism. We've got to come out of these. We've got to come out of these. Now, this, this six-pointed, uh, six-sided, six-triangle symbol, th this is used in Hinduism. This is all over India. I've been to India. It's all over India. It's in temples of Shiva. Uh, it's in temples of Hanuman. And they use that as a, as, a, as a Kabbalistic symbol of alchemy as above, so below, okay? And you can see all over the world, from Phoenicia to Japan to Rome, they've used this symbol. And in the occult, this is known as a hexagram. This is how you bring, it's a hex, hexagonal for, uh, for conjuring demons, all right? So we don't want this. And why am I telling you this? Because... We need to be careful that we don't have this thing flying around our gaff because this is how you bring a demon up in the occult. I don't care what it, what, what else you think about it. That's what the occult think. Mm. So if you want to do what the occult do, then more fool you. But I would not have this in my gaff because I knew from day one that this was related to Baal worship. Mm. This is the star of Remphan. This is the star of Remphan. And we cannot fall into this idolatry. We cannot fall into this idolatry, beloved. I tell you what Moses says. This is what he says. Moses said, the Lord is my banner. Amen. You want a flag? There's your flag. Yahovah. None of this. Moses said, Yahovah is my banner. This is it. Not some side, not six pointed, six sided, six polygram star. We need Yahovah as our banner. Yeah. And I don't want people falling into idolatry over this because this is what the occult use. We want to steer away from what the occult use and head in the path of righteousness, yeah. head in the path. But you could say, oh, well, they've just hijacked that and they've just used it. But look, we've got to come out of all the religions, whether it's the cross, whether it's the crucifix, whatever. We don't want any of them things and we don't want no flags because if we start bringing the flag of the state of Israel, well, what about the Welsh flag with the dragon on it? 
What about the Moroccan flag with the pentagram on it? What about the Pakistani flag with the, uh, with the moon deity Allah on it? Like, where do we draw the line with this? Where do we draw the line with this? We have to come out of all the mystery religions. Remember what it was called in the latter days? Egypt and Sodom spiritually. Yeah. Egypt and Sodom spiritually. And I'm going further with it. Furthermore, the state of Israel have committed war crimes. Talmudic Kabbalistics as politicians. What is the Kabbalah? It's Jewish mysticism, it's Jewish magic that come out of Babylon. And there's politicians who govern that state who are Kabbalistics into the Talmud. We have to come away from this. And some things on the screen, um, the state of Israel at the fastest vaccination rollout. Yeah. Come on. Now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not slamming the people here. No. I'm slamming the political state of Egypt, the political state of Sodom. That's what I'm slamming. And they're flying in with these tanks and these bunker busters and these cluster bombs, bombing Palestine who have no air force, no military, no navy, no barracks. Yeah, Hamas are evil, we know that. But people are dying here and they're flying in with this pentagram, this hexagram. And the Jews, they, we went to the Western War. We went to Israel a long time ago, got a half of the Jews. And they had, they had chickens swing, ringing the chickens' heads off, swinging blood round the gaff. And we were like, this is just horrendous. This is just horrendous. A recent video that went viral, uh, Hasidic Jews walk past and they're spitting on Christians. It's becoming yeah. a big thing in the land of Israel at the moment. We even have young girls writing out on the missiles. This is not right. This is what's going to bring the holy war, beloved. This is what's going to make Islam go to war as well. And yeah. the devil's priming it. And he's playing both sides of the chessboard. And sooner or later, this is what's going to go bang in the Middle East. And we cannot take a side because Yahovah is our banner. Oh, Yahovah is our banner. So there was a proposed bill that was actually just been put on hold, but they were that close to, to, to passing it in, in their governmental system. And you can see the headline, Christians will face jail in Israel uh, for proselytizing on the proposed bill. So you could go to Nick for speaking about Yeshua yeah. in Jerusalem. This is why it's spiritually called Sodom. This is why it's spiritually called Egypt in the latter days. So are we in the last days? Have we just seen evidence yeah, for right. The state of Israel, the, the Jerusalem, not, not the Jerusalem, the mother of us all. Not Israel, the spiritual nation of God. Not the land, as in God's land. I'm talking about the occupation, the occupation of idolatry. Listen, this whole Bible, all the way through, speaks about how Israel worshipped Baals, rejected the Lord, and fell into gross idolatry. Why do you not think that it's not happening today when the Messiah has been crucified? Of course it is, all the more so that he's been crucified. The divorced, the divorced, and until he remarry through Yeshua, these are the plagues that are going to take place. Let's have a look at Sodom, because Jerusalem is going to be called Sodom in the last days. Behold, welcome to Tel Aviv, the gay capital of the world. I mean, they're saying it, not me. This is on brochures when you're looking to travel to Israel. Tel Aviv is the gay capital of the world. Mm. Requests for abortion in Israel at record high. At record high. This is in the land. This is why it's spiritually called Sodom. And it's spiritually called Egypt. When the king of kings come, this is not going to take place in his land. We have to understand that this is all part of the prophecy. Now, this transgender agenda that is being pushed is actually nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. This is an article for evidence of transgender in Samaria and a way in which the Sumerians worshipped Asheroth and Ishtaris was actually through tra transgender uh, roles so men would dress as women and women would dress as men and I've got an article here for the evidence of trans in the lives of Sumer all right and if we read here it says the people of Sumer parade before you the male prostitutes comb their hair before you they decorate their napes of their necks with colored scar uh, scarves the woman the women adorn their right side with men's clothing the men adorn their left side with women's clothing this is what's going on and here we have Israeli Catholic wins first Miss Trans Israel. This is in the times of Israel. This is, this is how 
the Canaanites worshipped their gods, and now you're you're telling me that this has not seeped in to the state of Israel. It's right there before you. Israel presents itself as the haven for the gay community. It's actually like it's well referenced within trans rights communities where they do document like the history of of this like throughout ancient cultures. Yeah, so yeah. it's not like a, a hidden thing. It's something they use in terms of their apologetics for their rights and the historical nature of it. So I think it's it's good to actually be aware of these things in terms of like how we arm ourselves when we do. Yeah, get caught in the crossfire, Notice as well in the scripture of Sumer, look what it says, without your consent. What are they doing to our kids now? Yeah, yeah. What are they doing without your consent? The covering of the father and mother, uh, without your consent, uh, bang, we're going to push this one on you there. Because yeah. this is how you worship Bathomet. This is how you worship these anthropomorphic, hermaphrodite gods and goddesses, the fallen angels, basically. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. It's right there. Go ahead, bro. Yeah, it's um, it's it's quite it's so vital really that we we look into these things because especially in the messianic community, you know, this this flag is waved around quite a lot, and it is with good intent. It, it really is, and I know a lot of people who have come come to faith through knowing that this land is being restored, and and they what it is is when 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 we're reading of the word Israel. It's not this state of Israel. What it is, it's it's been hijacked. The word that the full grant of land that was given to Israel is fairer than what they've actually got now, and they've unfortunately hijacked the name. So when we're seeing like in the text, pray for Israel. Me personally, I I think this is, it's a lot deeper than what we know. This has been hijacked, and this is a state of Israel. So people are, are in, in a lot of ways in this in the Torah community are worshiping man's laws. When we're, when we're told to wor worship the Creator and His commandments and His laws. Like, if this was truly a blessing, what was going on in Israel, we wouldn't see uh, <laughs> Tel Aviv take place because they're not following the commandments. We wouldn't see uh, Israel, the state of Israel, I won't call it Israel, I'll call it the state of Israel. The state of Israel is one of the most anti-Christ countries we know in the world. You, you literally can get put in prison for preaching the gospel. And still, the irony of it is that Christians will wave that flag, even though it's an anti-Christ nation. So it's for, for, for me, it, it, it's, it's, it's very deep. And, and they've hijacked words, just as we see marriage has been hijacked for the consummation of two men. That, that's not that what that term means marriage so it's very clever what's took place here and of course this is prophecy taking place and, and this is all in god's control and he knows what he's doing and, and, and this is all coming to a pinnacle of what we're reading in revelation mm -hmm, here mm -hmm. as joe's exposing but it's so important that we don't get caught up in the politics of these things that's right and this is why we've been very we're not political in this fellowship we're really not as much as you see on this screen and we, we, we want to keep it biblical and this is keeping it, it, it biblical thank you bro let's have one more look at this then so spiritual fornications and spiritual adultery go even further so the muslims they all bow to our last mosque to the cobblestone yeah. they all bow to a stone the Jews, they all bow and kiss the Western Wall to a stone. And the Catholics, they all go in on their hands and knees and kiss a stone in the Church of the Sepulchre. They're all bowing down to stone. They're all bowing down to stone. Yeshua said, not one brick will be left standing of this temple. They will all be overturned and crushed. So that's not the temple. That's not even a part of it. It can't be because the words of Yeshua said, not one brick will be left standing. But the kiss on a stone, the Muslims, the kiss on a stone, the Catholics are kissing stones. Leviticus 26, you shall not make an idol for yourself, no graven image, neither shall you rear up a standing image, neither shall ye set up any image of stone within your land to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. This is why it's called Sodom and Egypt. Mm. And I had a conversation with a devout Muslim and I said, when you pray to Mecca, you pray into a stone, you know, a Kaaba stone. And he said, yeah. And he said, it was Abraham's. And I said, no, you, you're meant to pray to God. Why are you praying and bowing to a stone? Do you not know that it says in your text, 
and he shouldn't bow down to a stone. And he couldn't see it. He was like, no, no, we're bowing down to God. That's a, a mediator between God and us on earth. And I'm like, nah, mate. But the Catholics will tell you the same thing. Oh, this is where our, the body of the king was, was. And the Jews will say, well, this was our temple. And they'll kiss stone as well. And they're all falling into this gross idolatry. They're still worshipping stones today in the land. They're still worshipping stone in the land. This is what God hates. He hates that. He hates that. They're all kissing and worshipping stone. Let's read Isaiah 1. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burnt with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. Verse 8. So the daughters of Zion are left as booths in a vineyard, as a hut in the garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Verse 9. Unless the Lord of hosts had a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. This isn't Sodom and Gomorrah. That was destroyed with fire and brimstone. He's alluding to Jerusalem being Sodom and Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? Saith the Lord, I have had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls and goats or lambs. Verse 12, when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring me no more futile sacrifice. Incense is an abomination to me. New moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of the assemblies. I cannot endure the iniquity and the sacred meetings. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. How the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice. Righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers occupy it. There's nothing new under the sun. This prophecy is still taking place now today. What makes you think that this can't happen when they've rejected the sun? Jeremiah 23, 14 to 15. Also, I have seen a horrible thing in the prophets of Jerusalem. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They also strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns back from his wickedness. All of them are like Sodom and Gomorrah to me and their inhabitants like Gomorrah. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood and I will make them drink the water of God from the prophets of Jerusalem. Profanity has gone out into all of the land. What do we see in Revelations take place? What does the Lord say he's going to do because of the abominations taking place in Jerusalem? Feed them with wormwood. Revelations 8 verse 10. And a third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the spring waters. The name of that star is wormwood. And the third of the waters became wormwood. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. What that is, is that a fallen angel? Is that some nuclear pour out? Is that some thermonuclear device that goes bang? It's probably both. But whatever it is, wormwood is going to get poured out on this earth because of the abominations that are taking place. What is the mark of Jehovah? What is it? It's for them that sigh and cry at the abominations taking place in Jerusalem and hold fast to the sign of the Sabbath yeah. in Yeshua. Remember this place was called spiritually Sodom and Gomorrah. Call it whatever you like now. State of Israel, political state, whatever. It's known as Sodom and Egypt spiritually. So for them that are spiritually minded, this is what we've diagnosed it as. We're in the place where our Lord was crucified. And that same spirit, that slew, Yeshua, still occupies that place, you know. I've been. Hear it from me firsthand. It still occupies... It still occupies that place in Islam, in Judaism, in all, of the, in all the mystery religions. Even the Catholics don't want to know the true Yeshua. They still reject the true Yeshua. Now nah, give me the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Pope lover. <laughs> and listen, I'm not the only one saying this. this. It's my duty as a watchman to, to make sure people don't fall into this trap of falling into idolatry and taking sides of a Sodom and an Egyptian spiritual nation. Even Jews in this world reject the political state of Zionism. There's millions of them that do that won't go to the land. 
are because they know that the land is only given from the River Nile to the River Euphrates. That's not that little footy pitch. That's half the Middle East. When the Messiah comes back, yeah. that's, when we, that's when we go. And there's loads of Jews out there that say Zionism is not Judaism. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's loads out there that do that. Jews all over the world reject that political state. And we too cannot get caught in this crossfire again, political. Okay, we need to be like these people and say, hey, I'm taking a back step from this. This doesn't, this doesn't look right to me. And it's not Torah and it's anti-Mashiach. And it looks like spiritual Sodom and spiritual Egypt. But look, there's hope. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put This is in Isaiah. This is how the Lord follows through with his grace and his mercy. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil from your doings. Uh, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken this. Okay, um, let's open our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 4. We're going to go from verse 1 to verse 24. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor. For the Lord your God has destroyed them from among you. Excuse me. For the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who follow Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For at whatever reason we may call upon him. Mm. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments? as are in all this law which I set before you this day. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And teach them to your children and your grandchildren, especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, that they may teach their children. Then you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the midst of heaven, with darkness, cloud, and thick darkness. And the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice. So he declared to you his covenants, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments, that you might observe them in the land which you cross over to possess. Take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, or the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, or the likeness of any fish that is in the water beneath the earth. And take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and stars, all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given 
to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be his people and an inheritance as you are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and swore that I would not cross over the Jordan and that I would not enter the good land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. But I must die in this land. I must not cross over the Jordan, but you shall cross over and possess that good land. Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Thank you, Tom. So we have a call uh, against idolatry there by Moses. Jehovah, verse Baal, Deuteronomy 4, verse 3. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Pure, for the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal of Pure. Now, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, regarding Baal being a Canaanite deity, and part of my conversion was when I found out that the God of the Bible, Jehovah, was fundamentally at war with Molech, Baal, Asheroth. I mean, I fell in love with Yah then when I found out he was a warrior, a mighty man of valor and he was going to destroy all these bars, all these fallen angels. That was a big thing for me, because I understood the Satanists worshipped Baal and Molech, and they still do it in Acacia Groves now. Bohemian Grove is one of them, let's be real. Politicians and all that all gather around and worship Molech, and they say they just do it for a laugh, and it's an effigy, and it's not real. Well, whatever. Yeah, they say a lot of things. They say a lot of things. But Jehovah is against Baal. He's fundamentally... Um, in opposition to Baal and all forms of Baal worship. Jehovah is going to destroy all the Baals of this earth. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess there is none other than him, oh, Jehovah. He will just wipe away. He's going to wipe away so that the names of these fallen angels are not even found on our tongue anymore. Oh, yeah. Delete all files. They're going to get eradicated off the hardware. Mm. in the bin and then empty the trash bin and then throw the computer away that's what he's going to do you get me check this out Deuteronomy 3.29 in the King James Bible again beautiful so we abode in the valley over against Beth Peor or house of Peor as it translates or house of Baal Peor Baal Zebub Baal Peor these were all terms for Baal they were all terms for Baal fallen angels but we must live as israel in opposition to baal worship notice the israelites are called to live opposed to baal so they encamped over against the house of baal beth peor um, we are to dwell set apart and not as the nations because believe it or not deuteronomy 4 tells us that all the nations actually worship the sun and the moon and the stars. They all worship the fallen angels, whether they know it or not, even an atheist, because they believe that they come from the stars and the Big Bang. Oh yeah, I made a stardust. Oh yeah, it was the stars that made me. Oh yeah, the sun gives its life so I can live. It's all star worship, even atheism fundamentally. Whether it's Judaism, Islam, this is why they have the star, the star, the star, the star. And we're told in Deuteronomy 4 to come away from that. We don't worship the stars. We don't bow down to the sun, the moon, or any of the stars. And we come away from the luminaries, yeah? So we, as the set-apart nation of God, our abode is over against the Baals. We do not live in Baal territory. We, we, we are over against. We are in opposition towards the Israel of God dwells over against, it says in the King James Version, revealing the opposition to the Baals of this world, revealing how we are to be opposed to the satanic religions and the satanic systems of this Babylonian matrix. We live opposed to them. We live far off from them, in opposition to them. Amen. Proverbs 28 verse 4 says this, Those who forsake the law praise the wicked. But those who keep the law strive against them, contend them with evil, simple, you know. 
for my whole life I thought that it was about going on marches and you know like you know standing outside Masonic lodges with banners and down with you know the conservative thing and this hierarchy of the system and yeah I want to listen to the Beatles and Pink Floyd and grow my hair and that's how I thought like how you rebel against evil and but I was actually a product of the matrix as well because there's think tanks out there that are creating a rebellious movement of anarchy and the target in the youth of this is how you should rebel and damn with the system and all that. But it's actually a program in the matrix. Really, the Bible says how we rebel against the evil is through keeping the law. Because the devil is the lawless one. So if we're lawless, we're worshipping the devil. But if we keep the law and we do righteousness, we're worshipping God. Because God gave us righteousness in the law. So all my life I was an anarchist towards the system. And it wasn't until I came to this path that I actually found out that the true way to be opposed to evil was to do the law of God. It was to do the commandments. It was to do the law. The law. Because those who forsake the law praise the devil. But those who keep the law strive against the devil. And it makes sense because if we do righteousness and hear and do righteousness and goodness, mm. well, we're creating a habitat of goodness. We're pressing into the kingdom. But if we do wickedness, we're creating a habitat of evil. It's just that simple. Those who keep the law, those who shama re'e and asa the law, they strive against the devil. We don't need banners and arranged marches outside the town hall. We need to keep his law. And this is how Israel abode against Baal. They kept what God said. So we spoke earlier today regarding the two men who Yeshua is accompanied with. We spoke about Moses. We focused on Moses. These two men were unanimously famous for their victories over Baal. Moses was famous for his victories over Baal. Executed prophets of Baal. Baal, Saphon, uh, Balak and Balaam, they were all took out the game. Moses was famous for this. But Elijah is also famous for his victory over mm -hmm. Baal. So we're going to examine Elijah as the next witness. As he is uniquely famous for overcoming the Baals of this world. The Baalheads, as I like to call it. <laughs> the Baalheads, man. So let's get into it. We're going to turn to 1 Kings 18. This is a beautiful epic of Elijah who calls fire down from heaven to consume the offering of God and execute judgments on the prophets of Baal. Now this, what we're about to read, is a type and shadow of the end times, just as it was with Moses and Balak and Balaam, and the, and the beast and the false prophet in the hall, um, that is Balak, Balaam and the Moabite women. This also is a type and shadow of how the Lord is going to come and execute judgments with fire. Okay, so we're going to see that. Now a bit of background to this before we get into it. The events that take place do in fact take place in an apostate Israel. They take place in a backslidden Israel where they're elevating all these bars, they're not doing the Torah and not worshipping Jehovah. The whole kingdom is ruled by Jezebel. It's Ahab, but Jezebel was the one who, who had influence over Ahab. So it was the whore. It was the prostitute. It sounds like the Catholic Church in Jerusalem, doesn't it? got its fingers everywhere okay so after israel had gone three and a half years without rain very symbolic of revelations 11 this is the typology this is the, the blueprint of what we've just read about in revelations 11 the prophet elijah confronts king ahab and challenging challenges him to a spiritual showdown which is what we're going to read about now 400 prophets of baal 450 prophets of asherim uh, are brought together and Elijah single-handedly faces 850 prophets of Baal, basically, uh, alone. But he wasn't alone because the Lord was with him. And it's here, Elijah makes a famous statement to all of Israel. How long will you falter between the two? If you are of Jehovah and he is God, worship him. But if you are of Baal and he is your God, worship Baal. It's a famous statement by Elijah. So let's get into it. We're going to go from verse 17. Let's get into it. Verse Kings 18, verse 17. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, 
Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Verse 18, and he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all of Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now notice how it says that they eat at Jezebel's table. What does Paul tell us? 1 Corinthians 10, 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Amen. 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 This is why I teach what I teach. Because I don't want us to even have a sip or a sniff of that demonic cup out in the name of Yeshua. We don't even want to sit at the table. Never mind, eat the banquet. We don't even want to sit there. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel, all of them, and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. This must have been a spectacle. The whole nation's mm. there. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If Yah is your God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls. Let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and I will lay it on wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call upon the name of your gods and I will call upon the name of Yahovah Savayot and the Elohim who answers by fire. He is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Verse 25. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourself a bull, prepare it, as many as you are, call upon the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given to them and they prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning till evening, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. <laughs> but there was no voice, no one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. A couple of things I want to highlight here. Notice how Elijah confronts them and says, choose this day whom you will serve, but they don't say a word. How often do we put that challenge on people? Hey, look, are you going to serve the Lord or are you going to serve the world? Hey, look, are you going to serve the Lord or serve the flesh? And they just go mute. It's the same spirit. When we challenge people regarding who we're going to truly worship, people often go mute. Notice how Elijah reiterates many times, put no fire under it. He's saying no trickery, no trickery. Mm. Don't get involved because this is going to be the real deal, this. Because often in these places, how they tricked the people was like uh, showcasing, like a lot of the magicians and stuff, they were actually just uh, into alchemy. So they had alch alchemic methods in science of how to do certain things that would just amaze the people. But Elijah literally calls fire down from heaven. And as you see, he says, put water all over it. And this is fire and water. This is going to break the boundaries of physics. It's going to break the boundaries of physics. Notice how he also says that God who answers by fire, he is God. What did we just read in Deuteronomy? The Lord thy God is a consuming fire. This is indicative of the final judgment when the whole earth is consumed in fire. Notice how the pagan prophets, they call on Baal from morning to evening, but there was no voice, no one answered. The master uses this in the Sermon on the Mount. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the pagans do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have in need before you ask him. Sometimes I don't pray because I groan so deeply in the entrails that I don't even need to say anything because I've grown so deeply in the entrails. Are you like that? Do you groan in your entrails? Do you really groan with your liver and your kidneys and all your innermost? The heart of hearts is a Hebrew idiom for the entrails. That's the heart, but the heart of hearts is the entrails. That was what was wanted on the altar. The heart of hearts, the entrails. David says, my kidneys are sore with anxiety. David thought with his entrails, the entrails are super important. We're only just finding out now that the gut has a brain. And it, there's, more, there's more synapses going on in there than there is up here sometimes. The gut has a brain. So groaning inside and in our entrails is a big form of priestly operation because that's the entrails on the altar then. 
the entrails don't talk, they groan, all right? That's where feelings and emotion mm -hmm. are. So if, if, if you are groaning, you don't need to come out with these big elaborate prayers to the Lord. Keep it concise, <coughs> keep it real, keep it true, keep it uh, uh, in precision and allow the groaning to do the work because that's the deceit of emotion, that's the seat uh, of the inner man. First Kings 18. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating or he's busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and they began to cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out. And when midday was past, they prophesied that the time of the offering and at the evening offering, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. But all ain't gonna an answer no prayers when the Lord shuts his mouth. These fallen angels are allowed to exist for now, but they're all on a leash, they're all on the payroll. And one day they're all gonna be thrown in the lake of fire. All these softwares are gonna be deleted. So they're all under the sovereignty of the Lord. And when he shuts the mouth of the El Elil, they go mute, they can't do nothing. The demons fear and tremble at the Lord. We need to fear the Lord alone. Notice part of their worship was cut in the flesh. Now this still goes on today in Islam. This still goes on. It's a ceremony of self-flagellation um, of, of a festival called Ashura in Afghanistan, Baghdad, places like that. They actually whip the backs, males whip the backs. They even take blades and cut, maim the children, pour all this blood out on the floor. So this still goes on today. I'm not me. When we read about this, that they all cry to their God and cut themselves, thinking that they'd be heard. There's nothing new under the sun. The, the, Bible, the Bible confirms this reality. This reality doesn't confirm the Bible. That was in the Bible thousands of years ago. It's yeah. still going on now. They still do it now. But it's ball worship. Go ahead, bro. Yeah, even um, you know, in the West now, self harming's quite big. It's, it's, it's huge. It's revealing the spirit behind it, isn't it? Yeah. And how to mm -hmm. um, give direct targets of prayer against That's right. That's Mark, but Mark 5, look, Legion's there, he's cutting himself, he's amongst the tombs, and next minute he's sitting at the feet of Rabbi Jesus, Shemarin. That's the power of Yeshua over the demonic, that though people may self-harm and have this spirit in them to do that, like Legion, next minute he's sitting at the feet of Rabbi Yeshua going on an apostolic mission. So Elijah mocked them, it said. It's funny this, it's funny. Elijah was the mocking prophet, but he had license to do so. Why? Proverbs 1, verse 26. This is the Lord speaking. I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. I used to think that was quite harsh until I understood the full character of the Father that he's actually addressing. Baal worshippers here, and he's like, you've gone that far with it that you're going to become a product of your own desire. And I'm going to laugh because this is so humorous to me that you actually think that the, the devil's going to win. It's just funny. It's like, it's turned into, a, he's having a laugh over it. Like, we take this walk that's serious. I know, you know, light and dark, and it's dead deep, and God's laughing his head off, going, but what's the devil going to do? Already done. <laughs> I've said it before, God could just go like that, and the devil's gone. So, he's laughing his head off, isn't he? You know, he's laughing his head off, and we have to sometimes put that mindset on when we see all these things taking place, that God is going to laugh when the calamity of, of the bar worshippers comes upon them. Mm. Then Elijah said to the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he replied, uh, repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. Again, we're living stones being built into the temple of God. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living sacrifice on that altar, which is your reasonable service. It's super prophetic to the house of Jacob being that living sacrifice to whom the word of the Lord has come saying, Israel shall be your name. Verse 32, then when the stones he built an altar in the, sorry, then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made the trench around the altar large enough to hold two sheaths of seed. And he put wood in order, cut the pieces of the bolt and laid it upon the wood and said, fill four water pots full of water and pour it over the burnt sacrifice on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. And then they did it a second time. And then he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar and he filled the trench with water. Then it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, 
Lord Adonai of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, let it be known this day that you are the God of Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. So all this is taking place so that they teshuva. And he says, I've done all these things at your word. This wasn't Elijah just coming up with this mad, like, little protocol to stitch the bar heads up. This was all done at the word of the Lord. The Lord was telling him to do this. Verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. That sounds like a baptism of fire and water. Wow, hallelujah, that's who we need to be. That sacrifice, mm. that living sacrifice, immersed in fire and water. Verse 39. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Mm. Every knee will bow mm. and every tongue will confess. When that fire comes, every knee will bow and every tongue will Bounce. confess. The fact that it was fire and water together, that's when they realised this is the act of God. Yeah. Wow, yeah. It's a bit like Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. The fire and the hail, which is frozen water. That's right. It's a, the fire and the water is all symbolic of the, the, an act of God, power of God. That's right, bro. Praise Yah. And it's also symbolic of how we are to be baptised and immersed in fire and in water. John the Baptist said, one that comes will immerse you in water and in fire. And notice all of them at the end of this say, Yahweh is Elohim, Yahweh is Elohim. They all, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But listen, Verse 37 says, you have done this so that their hearts turn back to you again. When that tribulation of fire comes on this earth, it's not God being evil. He's turning the hearts of the people back to him. It's actually mercy and grace and compassion mm -hmm. that he brings the heat so that everyone goes, I need the saviour. And they all repent and then people can be in eternity with him. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a total different dynamic to seeing... A, a judgment that's outpoured where people are just getting destroyed for the fun of it. That's not the case. God does this. He brings the heat. He brings tribulation so that we turn, so that we repent, that our hearts turn back to you again, so that we bow and fall on our faces and say, you are God, you are God. Go ahead, bro. No, no I was just agree agreeing, but what, I'll leave uh, charm here. Um, when you was reading through it, you said, um, you read, uh, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, but it actually says, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Right. It, it, almost like Elijah there makes the distinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spiritual man. Hallelujah. Bless you, bro. That's a good spot. Okay, so we see this. We see this whole uh, scenario, epic conclusion with this fire that falls uh, from the Lord, falls out before the Lord. Second Peter three seven. But by His words, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and for the destruction of the ungodly people. The barleds, basically, yeah. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kidshon and executed them there. This is what's going to happen with Yeshua. He's going to say, seize them all, all the, all the Satanists yeah. and all the devil worshippers and all them that have done abominations. Seize them all, they're all going in the lake, you get me. So they seized them and Elijah executed them there. This is very prophetic of the conquering lion of Judah who, who comes back with his cloak dipped in blood, you know. That's what it says. He comes back with his cloak dipped in blood. The Lord is a mighty man of valor. The Lord is his name. He comes back with his cloak dipped in blood. That's serious gear. It says billions of people are going to die. Billions and billions. The blood is going to go to the bridles of horses' manes, mate. I mean, you don't know what this is going to be like. It's huge. This is just the type and shadow of it. Then Elijah went to the top of Mount Carmel. He bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servants, go up now, look towards the sea. So we went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And seven times he said, go again, seven again. It's like the indicative, yeah. the seventh day. Then it comes to pass at the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud. Yeshua comes back on a cloud, the hand of God, as mm. small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariots and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. And he geared up his loins and he ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. What an epic. Mm. 
Notice none of the prophets of Baal shall escape. We need to choose this day whom we will serve. If ye be of Yehovah, serve Yehovah, for he is God. And if ye be of Baal, serve Baal, for he is your God. But in, it's a suicidal mission, worshipping Baal, you know. It's suicide, mate. It's absolutely suicide. Now, check this climactic ending, because rain comes. How long had the rain been stopped? Three and a half years. What happens in Revelations for the two witnesses? How long do they stop the rain? Three and a half years. Very indicative. Now, if you know your Torah, you will know that in the book of Deuteronomy, God stops the rain for idolatry. Curiously, beloved, in Israel, it doesn't rain. So what did he need to do? Check this on the screen. Israel produce an artificial rain in the deserts. This is the state of Israel. They have to seed the skies with seed and technology. We've had 21 days of rain. It makes you think, what are they doing here? You get me? Well, in the desert, they make a chemical compound there that they spray with silver iodine and they actually make it rain. Because it doesn't rain there. They have to make it rain. Hello? Hello? Come on. Elijah shut the rain up for Baal worship. This is what's going on in the desert. It doesn't rain there. They need to make it rain with technology, with the trickery of alchemy. They need to make it rain. If that's not enough evidence for you, I don't know what is. And if they're messing around with the weather in the desert, openly saying, openly, that's on Wikipedia, that. Since the 1950s, they've been emitting silver iodine from aeroplanes. And ground station, this seeding takes place to cause... Uh, the enteric water system and rain to, to evaporate and concentrate in rain. It's like, this is what they're doing. I mean, what are they doing out there? Come on, I mean, you must know that they're messing around with things that they shouldn't. And this is a serious part of Elijah's ministry. We should take these things serious ourselves. So to end, the two prophets, Moses and Elijah, big hitters in the Torah time mystically taken uh, in their departure by angels and then they mystically appear with Yeshua at the Mount of Transfiguration. And before Yeshua comes back in his second coming as fire on a cloud, as a pure ray of light, two witnesses are gonna come in the spirit of Moses and Elijah. Let us be like the spirit of Moses and Elijah now. Let us be like the two witnesses now of the house of Jacob, not of the Gentiles, moving in the law and the prophets, the fullness of the scroll. Let us put sackcloth on and tell the world to repent and return before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Let us be like Moses and teach precepts as David said, and I shall teach sinners to return back to you. And I shall teach sinners their transgressions so that they can return unto you. Let us be like Elijah. Let us move in the prophetic. Let us bring the blessing of the latter and the former reigns in people's lives, watering the good seed and bringing fruit and prosperity into others. Let us keep the law and be opposed to bar worship. Let us have the mark, mark of Yah engraved on our foreheads. Let us sigh and cry for the abominations that take place in Jerusalem. The Lord will send prophets even days before he comes back. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. And though we have all sinned and fell short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life only, only through Christ Yeshua. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, to wash us, to cleanse us, to make us whole again. We bless you, O Lord God, for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Yeshua. We thank you for the prophets that have been sent, Lord, that we can be edified, Father. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you are opposed to the bars of this world, that you hate evil, that you hate with perfect hatred, sin and iniquity, Lord. Help us, therefore, Lord, to be righteous in your sight, for we have all fell short of your glory. Put your spirit within us, Lord, so that we can be changed and transformed. Renew our minds, O oh Lord, we pray. Let us be new creatures in you, for we are your worksmanship and not by our own strength, least any man boast. We bless you, O oh Lord God, for your law and for the prophets. And we bless you, O oh Lord, for Yeshua the Mashiach. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Amen.